Shinichiro is an ugly, lonely virgin otaku who gets transported to another world after applying for a job. His mission in this new world is to turn everyone into an otaku, but he ends up clapping every single waifu that comes his way. But before any of this, after acing a job application and test, Kanu Shinichiro meets the company boss who offers him a mysterious drink. Next thing he knows, he's passed out and wakes up in a completely different realm. The capital city of the Holy Elden Empire, to be exact. He's greeted by his new maid, Misul, and bodyguard, Minori, who fill him in on his new surroundings. Kanu's mind is blown when he spots a dragon flying overhead, thinking he stumbled into a real-life episode of House of the Dragon. Once he gets over the initial shock, Kanu asks for a tour of the city, but Minori puts it on hold, saying they need to meet someone first. Just then, an SUV pulls up, and the boss from his own world steps out. They they head back inside, where the boss explains that a hyperdimensional passageway opened up years ago, connecting their two realms. <laughs> To build a relationship between the worlds, they've hired Kanu and Otaku to bring Japanese pop culture, think manga, anime, and video games, to the Holy Elden Empire, which is still stuck in the Stone Age. The catch? Kanu's stuck in this new realm for the foreseeable future. He's hesitant, citing all the stuff he needs to pack. But when the boss asks if he knows the way back, Kanu's forced to admit defeat, slumping back into his chair. Musil drops by Kanu's room with a tray of tea and he's stoked to learn she's half elf, half human. As a hardcore otaku, his mind starts racing with all the anime and manga scenarios he can imagine with her. He even sneaks a photo of her, much to her surprise. <laughs> When he discovers she can't read, he takes it upon himself to teach her the basics of Japanese. The next day, Musil introduces him to Brooke, the gardener, and then wakes him up bright and early for breakfast. Kanu apologizes for his awkward behavior the day before, and just then, Minori appears, announcing that Matoba is waiting for them at the palace. They hop in a carriage and head to the throne room where they're introduced as Japan's representatives. Kanu and Minori bow their heads with Minori whispering a warning to Kanu to behave himself. But when a sultry voice asks if he's the new rep from Japan, Kanu is allowed to look up, and his jaw drops when he sees a gorgeous miniature-sized girl. What? What the? He freaks out, jumping up and down, yelling that he's not Drizzy Drake and can't be talking to a minor. <laughs> The girl gets furious, stomping towards him, insisting she's an adult who just turned 16. She lands a solid punch on Kanu, sending him crashing to the ground. As he rubs his sore face, he declares he's fallen head over heels in love with the tiny terror. After the drama in the throne room, Zakar, the advisor, manages to calm down the supreme ruler, Petralka. Matoba apologizes for Kanu's antics, and somehow, Kanu even gets Garius riled up too. But Petralka finds it all hilarious and gives them the green light to let people get cultured and promote otaku culture. On their way back, Matoba realizes he hasn't thought through Kanu's next moves, so he tells him to make a list of the materials he needs to make the cultural exchange a success. Kanu spends the rest of the night brainstorming, and later he heads to the kitchen to grab a drink and finds Mukul studying the Japanese basics he wrote for her. He offers to help her, and as the days go by, he gets the materials he needs and spends his evenings helping Mukul with her studies. After decorating one of the rooms with otaku posters and setting up his manga collection, Kanu gets a surprise visit from Petralka and her advisor Zakar, who looks like he's about to pass out from exhaustion. Petralka dives straight into the manga section but quickly realizes she can't read the language. She asks Kanu to read to her, and he obliges, sitting down with Mutil and Petralka on his lap. Nice. As he reads, he chats with Musil about their study sessions, but Petralka starts getting jealous, thinking Musil's making a move to get clapped by Kanu. She then insults Musil and sends her off to get them some drinks. <laughs> Hey, 
time! Kainu reads to Petralka for a while longer, then escorts her to her carriage, feeling like he's just survived a wild ride. When Kanu returns, he is startled by Brooke's glowing red eyes and instinctively throws a few punches out of fear. Brooke calmly hands him a piece of wood, saying if he wants to hurt him, he should use that instead. Kanu learns that in this world, it's not uncommon for masters to physically discipline their servants, which makes him want to explore the city and get out of the house. But, as he walks around, he notices that most shops have pictures on them because many people can't read or write. He also stumbles upon a group of kids training in combat and learns that Brooke and Musel were part of a similar program when they were younger. During their break, a couple of kids approach him and Kanu tells them he's there to introduce them to otaku culture. When he asks what they do for fun, they reveal that they don't really have time for leisure activities. After training, they help out on the farm and books are a luxury only noble kids can afford. Kanu wonders how he's going to get them excited about manga. Later back at the house, Kanu is reading to Petralka when Mutel enters with a tray of tea. Petralka starts belittling Musel for no reason and just as she's about to throw a cup at her, Kanu steps in and talks some sense into her. <laughs> Petralka lets them off the hook, but only if Kanu agrees to teach her Japanese before Musil, thinking she'll be the first to ask him to have some plot with her. While Minori's in the bathroom, Kanu senses something off and soon discovers a lizard lurking around. Meanwhile, he finds Musil crying and clutching a manga in her hands. The school Shinichi is building is almost finished, and he's completely oblivious to the lizard lurking in the shadows. He continues his reading lessons with Petralka, who's now joined by a few other kids. After they leave, Petralka stays behind and tells Shinichi she's never seen anyone enjoy their work as much as he does. He opens up, saying he's starting to love his life in this new realm and appreciates getting to know her and Musel. But as soon as he mentions Musel's name, Petralka gets mad and storms off, calling him a stupid virgin loser, which unbeknownst to Shinichi is her way of giving him the green light to have some plot with her. Minori later explains that building a school for both servants and nobles threatens their social hierarchy. That night, Mukil shows off her language skills and they have a convo without using the translation rings. Days later, the school is finally complete. Musel brings Shinichi lunch, but Petralka shows up asking about Musel's progress. When Shinichi mentions that musel has been helping him, Petralka gets furious, feeling like he's always giving Musel attention. She orders Musel to leave Shinichi, then pushes him to the ground. Just then, the Patriot Knights burst in, slaughtering Petralka's guards and taking her hostage. <laughs> They drag Shinichi and Petralka to a room where they reveal a weapon that could blow up the entire building. The leader, Alessio, grabs Shinichi and prepares to execute him for corrupting their values by building a school that teaches commoners and nobles together. He spews some racist nonsense about humans being superior to elves, dwarves, and demi-humans. Just as Alessio is about to off Shinichi, Petralka intervenes. <laughs> <laughs> Telling the Patriot Knights that Shinichi is just an employee from Japan. If they kill him, they'll be celebrated as heroes, bringing peace to the land. Alessio spares Shinichi's life and takes Petralka instead, declaring her their real target. Meanwhile, Minori manages to snag a knife and starts cutting through her ropes. The Elden Empire Knights are waiting outside, ready to rescue their supreme ruler. Shinichi claims he needs to use the bathroom, and as he's being escorted, his phone's alarm starts blaring, freaking out the Patriots who think it's some kind of dark magic. They all rush towards him, and Alessio orders him killed on the spot, but Minori bursts bursts in, sword in hand, and starts taking down the Patriots. Musel arrives with Petralka, casting a spell that takes out the knights. Alessio tries to use his weapon, but Shinichi quickly grabs a fire extinguisher and disables it. Alessio lies defeated on the ground as the Empire army storms into the school. Just as Alessio tries to knife Petralka, Mukul jumps in the way, taking the blade instead. <laughs> Yes, sir. 
Petralka is overcome with emotion, wondering why Michelle would sacrifice herself like that. Michelle, with her eyes closed, replies that she believes in the manga's message of people from different walks of life learning to understand each other. As Petralka screams for her guards to get a doctor, Musel's eyes flutter shut. Musel's recovering nicely at the palace and the school's finally in session. As expected, the first day is a mess, with kids from different races insulting each other left and right. A month later, Musel's back at the mansion where she's greeted by a cluttered office. The next day, after teaching his students a thing or two, Shinichi wraps up the lesson and hops in a carriage with Minori heading home. As they ride, Minori keeps an eye on the monitors and notices some suspicious movement outside their mansion gates. She mentions that if it were Brooke, the system wouldn't have picked up on him, so this must be someone else. When they arrive, they catch a humanoid snooping around, sketchbook in hand. She introduces herself as Elvia, an artist, and Shinichi's immediately smitten with her massive plots. However, Minori is not buying it, suspecting that Elvia's a spy from the Bahailum Kingdom, which borders the Elden Empire. Before long, the palace guards show up and whisk Elvia away to the palace for questioning. Minori fills Shinichi in on how the palace prison treats its inmates, and the next day, Shinichi, Mutsul, and Minori head to the palace to try and spring Elvia. Elbia from jail. Shinichi claims he needs Elbia for his otaku projects, citing her amazing art skills. Though, let's be real, it's not just her talent he's interested in. He wants to have some plot with her. Petralka raises an eyebrow, wondering if Shinichi's just looking for a new conquest, but he denies it. When Elbia is brought out, Shinichi vows to prove she's not a spy. However, her answers to their questions only confirm her espionage skills. Shinichi comes up with a plan to feed her false intel, which she can then report back to her handlers. Petralka agrees to let Elbia stay with Shinichi, and when he tells her she's off the hook, Elbia throws her arms around him in gratitude. <laughs> Petralka is not having it though, and tells Shinichi he needs to keep his meat in his pants and not have plot with her. Elbia had finally started drawing anime characters, and her artwork was just as amazing as Shinichi had expected. Despite their cultural differences, the whole household sat down together for meals, which would probably raise some eyebrows in the rest of the realm. The next day at school, Shinichi taught his students about games. When he got home, he found Mukul struggling to carry Elbia's massive laundry load. It turned out Elbia's clothes got dirty super fast due to her intense drawing sessions. Shinichi apologized for the trouble and offered to lend a hand. As they worked on the laundry together, he asked Musel where Elbia was during dinner. Musel replied that she was in her room but didn't want to eat. Shinichi decided to check on her and called out her name, but she didn't respond. He walked into her room and was blown away by the sheer number of drawings scattered everywhere. His eyes landed on one particular piece, a drawing of him clutched tightly in her hand. Elbia stared at him with an intense gaze, like she was about to give him the Glock Glock 3000. Shinichi was startled and quickly backed out of the room, wondering what was going on with her. The next day at school, Minori chatted with Shinichi, but he was still reeling from Elbia's sudden personality shift. In class, he found his students bickering over their favorite game characters. <laughs> After getting them to settle down and teaching them a thing or two, the school day finally came to an end. When he got home, Musil greeted him with some unexpected news. Petralka had summoned him to the palace. As he glanced up at Elbia's window, he caught her staring at him, which only fueled his paranoia. <laughs> He was convinced she was a skilled assassin. Little did he know, she just wanted a glimpse of his meat. At the palace, he got the full Petralka Tsundere experience. After that drama-filled encounter, he headed back home, still worried about Elbia's strange behavior. While teaching Musel, he casually asked if she'd come with him if he ever went back to Japan. To his surprise, she agreed without hesitation. Later that night, Shinichi woke up from a nightmare where Elbia was trying to kill him, only to find her sitting on top of him in real life. 
but this time she just wanted to get clapped by him. She confessed that her recent behavior was because all she could think about was his meat and she couldn't control herself around him. <laughs> The next morning at school, Shinichi walked into another heated debate. This time, the students were arguing over the best anime snacks. The next day, Shinichi walked into another argument between the dwarves and L. Time to intervene. He gathered Minori, Nusel, and Elbia to check out the storage room where the Japanese government had sent some goodies for them. That's when they stumbled upon a limited edition ball meant for Minori. She was thrilled, but her excitement was short-lived. Elbia suddenly snatched the ball from her hands and started playing with it. Minori was furious and things escalated quickly. She whipped out a gun ready to take aim at Elbia, but the army intervened just in time. Shinichi quickly came up with a plan, telling Michelle to use her magic to stop Elbia. Nusel obliged and Elbia finally apologized, explaining that werewolves lost their senses when they saw something that resembled the moon. Minori, still fuming, eventually handed the ball back to Elbia. Shinichi had an epiphany. Why not get the dwarves and elves to play a friendly soccer match? He ran the idea by Petralka and she was on board. Even Matoba offered to lend a hand and Nusel, now a teacher at the school, was stoked about the match. The dwarves and elves elves got to work, practicing their skills. On the day of the big game, Minori was busy snapping photos of both teams and the entire city came out to watch the excitement. The first half of the match was a total blowout. The dwarves' supernatural strength helped them score a whopping 50 goals, while the elves didn't manage to score a single point. But after halftime, the elves were allowed to bring out the big guns, aka their magic. The soccer field quickly turned into a scene straight out of Avengers Infinity War, with spells flying left and right. Surprisingly, the human spectators were loving every minute of it. Shinichi, on the other hand, was feeling pretty deflated. His plan to bring the elves and dwarves together through soccer had seemingly backfired. The field was left in shambles and the match ended in a tie, with both teams exhausted. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, Petralka suddenly appeared on the field, wearing a jersey and ready to take matters into her own hands. With a little help from Musel's magic, she sprinted toward the goal and scored. <laughs> The crowd went wild as she high-fived the elves and the audience gasped in shock. They'd never seen a noble shake hands with a servant before. Shinichi couldn't help but smile, feeling a sense of pride that everyone had witnessed this momentous occasion. But as he soon found out, old habits die hard. The next day at school, he walked into another argument between the dwarves and elves. Shinichi was fuming at Matoba for bringing him the wrong books. He decided to take matters into his own hands and announced that he'd be heading to Japan himself to get the books he wanted. Since the passageway was a secret, Matoba and co. hatched a plan to get him high on shrooms before sending him off. But Matoba refused to let Shinichi take Mukul along, claiming that the Japanese heir wouldn't agree with her. Little did he know, Musil had other plans. On the day of their departure, she snuck into a bag and tagged along with Shinichi to Japan. When Shinichi discovered her hiding in the bag, Musel confessed that she was scared he wouldn't come back to their realm. Meanwhile, back in the palace, Garius was keeping Petralka busy with a mountain of paperwork, promising to call Shinichi to the palace soon. Zakar and Garius later received news that Shinichi was in Japan and would be returning the next day. Shinichi spent the day showing Musel around the city, and she was thrilled to see all the things she'd only seen in books and shows. After lunch at a restaurant, they headed back to his apartment where Shinichi realized Musel didn't have a spare pair of underwear. He popped out to buy some, leaving her to freshen up.
When he returned, he found her fast asleep, wearing his shirt. Seeing her massive plots, he couldn't help but think about the things he could do with her. Back in the palace, Petralka finished her paperwork and was informed that Shinichi was in Japan. Zakar and Garius were bracing themselves for her wrath, especially after Zakar's failed attempt to impersonate Shinichi. But to their surprise, Petralka simply walked out, leaving them stunned. The next day, Shinichi woke up back in the city, only to realize he'd forgotten to get the books he went to Japan for in the first place. Oops! After lunch, Shinichi and Minori headed to the palace to visit Petralka. But when they arrived at her room, they found a note saying she'd flown the coop. The entire palace went into panic mode, searching high and low for her. Shinichi eventually tracked her down to a storage room where she was snoozing in a box with three books clutched tightly in her hands. He could hear her murmuring for her parents in her sleep. Garius burst in, woke her up, and they all headed back to the palace. The next day, Petralka locked herself in her room, casting a spell to keep the Elden citizens out. Zakar and Minori gave up and walked away, leaving Garius and Shinichi standing outside her door. Garius filled Shinichi in on Petralka's family drama. Her parents had killed each other, and that's why she worked so hard but was now under immense stress. Since Matoba and Minori had spread the rumor that Shinichi was an expert on shut-ins, Petralka let him into her room thinking he just wanted to chat. Inside, Petralka declared that she was going to stay there forever, binge reading manga and watching anime. Shinichi decided to take matters into his own hands and created a mini shut-ins room in the corner of her room. When she saw it, she exclaimed that it was exactly what she had in mind. He then offered to answer any question she had and spent the rest of the day teaching her the ways of the shut-in. Meanwhile, Garius waited patiently outside her door. Minori told him to trust Shinichi, but when she peeked into the room, she started to have second thoughts. Stop it. Get some help. She beat a hasty retreat back to the mansion. Musil asked Minori where Shinichi was and she replied that he was spending the night at the palace. Musil promptly shut down and burned the dinner, leaving everyone waiting in vain. Back at the palace, Petralka suddenly had a craving for a good scrub. She and Shinichi snuck off to the bathroom with him trying to convince her that shut-ins don't bother with bathing. After their quick shower, they tried to sneak past the guards, but overheard them worrying about the Supreme Ruler's whereabouts. Once they were back in her room, Petralka asked Shinichi how he'd become a shut-in in the first place. He opened up about getting rejected by his childhood friend and feeling too embarrassed to go back to school. He'd skipped so many days that when it was time to return, turn, he just couldn't face his classmates and ended up retreating to the safety of his room, unable to look his parents in the eye. Petralka started to feel guilty for abandoning her responsibilities and stressing out Garius and Zakar. Meanwhile, back at the mansion, everyone was still waiting for dinner to arrive. Musil's cooking skills were clearly not up to par. The next morning, Petralka finally emerged from her bedroom door looking like a new person. Garius stopped by the mansion to thank Shinichi properly for helping them with Petralka. Petralka. While he was still there, Shinichi remembered Matoba mentioning their vacation plans, so he asked Garius if he knew of a sweet spot to relax. Garius offered them a stay at one of the Supreme Ruler's properties, which just so happened to be next to a lake perfect for swimming. Shinichi broke the news to Musil that they were all going on vacation together. Later, at the palace, Garius and Zakar were trying to convince Petralka to take a break from work and come back to it later. She asked about the other thing, and Zakar replied that they'd assembled a team to choose it for her. Meanwhile, a group of old men were huddled around a table, flipping through photos of girls in bikinis, Damn! acting like they were OVO members trying to pick out the perfect bikini for the supreme ruler. Meanwhile, Shinichi, Musil, Elbia, and Minori were living it up at the beach, playing in the water and having a blast. They took a break to chow down on some lunch, but their relaxation was short-lived. One of their students, Loic the Elf, came running towards them, looking frantic. When he finally reached them, they asked what was wrong, and he spilled that Romilda, a female dwarf student, was in grave danger. <laughs> The gang decided to take action, so they hatched a plan in the bushes while Minori kept a watchful eye on Shinichi. Elbia took on three beasts, cleverly herding them towards the elves. Musel and Loic teamed up to take down two of the beasts with their magic, and Elbia kicked the third one to the curb. As they were celebrating their victory, two of the beasts made a break for it. Elbia chased after them with Musel hot on their heels. Loic, meanwhile, tended to Romilda, who was still out cold. Elbia got caught in a trap, and Musel rushed to her rescue 
using a spell to trap the beasts in a hole. But before they could catch their breath, one of the beasts pounced on Musil. Shinichi sprinted towards them, terrified that Musil would get hurt again. Just as he was about to intervene, Minori fired a warning shot into the air and yelled at everyone to freeze. It turned out that the JSDF soldiers had arrived on the scene. When Minori snatched their camera, she was furious to find photos of girls in bikinis. She let out a loud rant, calling them Dr. Disrespect Minions while destroying the camera. Meanwhile, back at the palace, Petralka had finally wrapped up her work and was ready to hit the beach. The men presented her with a swimsuit and she was absolutely thrilled with it. Matoba breaks the news to Shinichi and Minori. They've got a major problem on their hands. Once they're seated, he explains that the JSDF was filming their match day, but somehow the footage has leaked online. His biggest worry is that the realm might be discovered, which would mean scrapping the entire project, but Shinichi stays calm and comes up with a plan to spin the leak into a marketing opportunity. They decide to create a fantasy movie around the footage making it seem like a promotional stunt. With the JSDF's help, they start filming the rest of the movie with the supreme ruler landing the role of the heroine. Meanwhile, Minori gets a message from a soldier that they finally found the dragon's cave. She hops in a car with Luna the elf and the soldier and they head to the cave. As they arrive, Minori warns them that dragons are super sensitive to certain smells and she starts spritzing herself with a special spray. But before she's done, the dragon wakes up and blasts them out of its cave. The team captures tons of footage with Romilda and Loic in charge of editing it all together. It's finally time to film the dragon scene and the team manages to whip up a fake one. But when Minori calls out for the dragon, a real one suddenly appears out of nowhere and starts attacking them. Petralka, however, is completely oblivious to the danger and doesn't even flinch, which is pretty hilarious. The JSDF jumps into action, firing at the dragon until it retreats. Still, Petralka has no idea that the attack was real. She thinks it's all just part of the movie magic. After wrapping up the final scene, everyone's stoked to watch the finished product. They set up an outdoor screening and a crowd gathers to check it out. As the movie starts rolling, everyone's having a blast until they get to Petralka's most embarrassing moments, that is. She starts freaking out, screaming at them to stop the movie and basically causing a scene. The screening quickly turns into a total disruption. The manga supply in the realm is running low and people are getting restless. They're arguing with each other, waiting for the next volume to drop. Shinichi sees the chaos and decides to chat with Matoba to get more books shipped in. But what he learns from Matoba is a total bombshell. The government's plan is to use otaku culture to infiltrate the realm, making the people obsessed with it to the point where they can't imagine a day without it. Then they'll limit the manga supply to control the population. Shinichi feels sick to his stomach when he realizes he's been a part of this plan all along. He was chosen for the job because he's an expert on otaku culture and if he disappeared no one would even notice. The fact that he's been using otaku culture to invade the realm just like the government makes him feel guilty and ashamed. Back in his room, Shinichi confides in Minori about his doubts. What if I just want to quit? He asks. Minori advises him to keep it on Loki for now, especially from Matoba. The next day, Shinichi attends a meeting with Petralka at the castle, where she's buzzing with excitement about spreading otaku culture throughout the country. But Shinichi's had enough. He snaps, leaving Petralka, wondering if that's not what he wanted all along. Later, Shinichi locks himself in his room, feeling trapped. Matoba shows up, telling Minori that the government's lost patience with Shinichi and is planning to replace him. Matoba delivers a stern warning to Shinichi. We're not like your parents who'll just let you shut yourself away. You need to face reality. That night, Shinichi ventures out to investigate a noise only to find Musel waiting for him with a homemade meal. After eating, he confesses his guilt to her, feeling like an invader who doesn't belong in the country. Musel reminds him of the positive impact he's had reuniting races through manga. This gives Shinichi a much needed boost of confidence. The next day, Shinichi visits the castle to propose an idea to Petralka. Why not create their own manga and anime so they're not dependent on the Japanese? 
Japanese government. Matoba looks less than thrilled, but Petralka and her cousin are on board. The crowd erupts in applause with Matoba's clap coming with a side eye that says, you're not off the hook yet, Shinichi. After Shinichi's bold proposal, the government sends a team to take him out, but the supreme ruler is one step ahead. She's got her people caught and contained. Matoba shows up, apologizing profusely and spinning a wild tale about rogue soldiers who think Shinichi is Jeffrey Epstein. The ruler isn't buying it, but she lets it slide, reminding Matoba that if anything happens to Shinichi, Eldand will cut ties with Japan. For a few days, things are quiet. One afternoon after classes, Minori mentions she's got to file her monthly report, so Shinichi heads home solo. Later that night, the supreme ruler gets word that their walls have been breached. She sends an owl to Misel at the mansion, who responds that she can see flames engulfing the school. Shinichi dashes to the school, desperate to save his precious manga and Musil. Brooke and Elbia tag along, and when they arrive, the school is in flames. Shinichi's been knocked out in the library, left to burn. Brooke keeps watch outside while the waifus storm in, ready to take on the attackers. Elbia takes on two foes while Musil rushes to find Shinichi in the library. She discovers him unconscious on the floor and uses her magic to hold up a bookshelf that's about to crush them. But her magic starts to falter. Meanwhile, Elbia's been tasered and Minori's been captured by Matoba and his army. Just as the soldiers are about to take out Elbia, Minori bursts in and saves her. The two of them then join Musil and together they make a daring leap out of the burning building. Matoba shows up, freaking out that they'll get kicked out of the country. But Shinichi's already thinking on his feet. He comes up with a plan to video call the big boss, and while they're chatting, Matoba starts making threats without realizing Petralka is listening in. They eventually strike a deal. If they try to attack again, they're out of there. But since Shinichi's otaku culture crusade is raking in profits for Japan, Matoba lets him continue spreading the love. The school reopens and life goes on. 